In this video, we'll discuss centrifugal distortion, which is another way in which the rigid rotor model can deviate from ideal behavior. So to remind ourselves again, as we do in this chapter, our model of the rigid rotor is a diatomic molecule. We have two atoms here, M1 and M2. They're connected by a bond length R, which is going to be constant and fixed in the rigid rotor model. The reduced mass of this system is equal to M1 times M2 over M1 plus M2. The moment of inertia, resistance to angular acceleration is equal to mu r squared. The energies of our rigid rotor model in terms of the quantum number j is equal to hc times b bar, the rotational constant, times j times j plus 1. b bar, the rotational constant, equals Planck's constant divided by 8 pi squared speed of light in centimeters per second times mu reduced mass times r bond length squared. So the frequency or inverse wavelength of the photon that we're going to absorb to go from two subsequent energy levels, so delta j equaling plus or minus one, we're either going to go up one and absorb a photon or minus one and emit a photon. So the frequency of that photon is one over hc e of j plus 1 minus e of j. So the frequency of this photon, once we derive that, that energy level, is 2 b bar times j plus 1, where j equals 0 and goes up to infinity, but is purely integer values. So under the ideal case, what we get there is a series of lines in our spectrum of pure rotational or microwave spectroscopy which is equally spaced starting at 2 in units of b bar. So omega bar divided by b bar is from 0 to 1, you get 2. 1 to 2 is 4. 2, two to 3 is 6. 3 to 4 is 8. 10, 12, 14, etc. Perfectly spaced lines at every 2 b bar. So what happens, in fact, as we get to longer are to higher and higher rotational energy levels. Well, in our harmonic oscillator model, we imagine that we have a spring connecting these two atoms. So let's think about that for a second. So our molecule first isn't rotating at all, and the spring is at rest at its equilibrium length, equilibrium bond length. But then, as we add more rotational quanta of energy to it, J goes up, we're going to spin around faster and faster, and the centrifugal forces are going to force this string to, spread, to stretch a little bit as it resists the expansion of the molecule as it rotates around. So as we go up to higher rotational levels, the molecule stretches a little bit and the bond length goes up. Just as in the previous video, when the bond length goes up, the moment of inertia goes up. When the moment of inertia goes up, which is in the denominator of our rotational constant, our rotational constant goes down. And that means our energy levels are going to get closer together. So what we have here is a rotational constant which depends on the rotational quantum number. We have b bar of j plus 1 is less than b bar of j. So what we can do here is we can model this. And there are more advanced ways to get this energy that I'm not going to discuss. But basically, we're doing a Taylor series in j times j plus 1. And what we get is that E sub j with this energy dependent rotational constant equals hc times the quantity b bar j times j plus 1, just as it was to begin with. Now we have a new term minus d bar j squared times j plus 1 squared. So d bar is called the centrifugal distortion coefficient. And that's a measure to the effect of how much longer the bond length gets as our rotational quantum number goes up. So omega bar, the difference between two subsequent energy levels when we have this model for our energy, ends up being, if you do the same kind of derivation we did above, is 2b bar j plus 1, the same term as before, minus the extra term 4d bar times j plus 1 cubed and j can still start at 0 and go up from there as an integer. So I have the effect of that drawn on this spectrum over here. So we'll start out with some difference in energy between the two peaks, which is less than 2b bar. But as we go, this is getting cubed, and it's negative. 
So they're going to get closer and closer and closer as we go up higher and higher in energy as our rotational constant gets smaller and smaller as we go. So the centrifugal distortion causes these peaks in our spectrum which should be equally spaced to get closer and closer together and deviate more and more from ideal behavior as we go up in J. Now luckily for us, this effect is highly exaggerated in my hand-drawn graph. Typically we saw that the values of B bar are somewhere between 0.1 and 10 wave numbers, whereas the value of D bar is somewhere between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 8th wave numbers. So this might matter in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, or even the 8th significant figure as far as where the centrifugal distortion coefficient comes in. So luckily for most, uh, most molecules that are diatomics, this effect is quite small, D bar is quite small, and the rigid rotor model is quite uh, a good model for predicting these rotational lines in the spectra. But we'll keep that in mind that whenever we do see failures in these lines that start getting closer together as we go higher up, that is probably due to this centrifugal distortion effect, and it is, can be measured in magnitude by the centrifugal distortion coefficient D bar.